Welcome to this special edition of The Crunch, recorded live at RE Bar Camp 2019. RE Bar Camp is an informal unconvention focused on the free exchange of ideas where all attendees are encouraged to participate. Thanks to our speakers this year who contributed their time to the event and please enjoy this special episode. Thank you everyone for attending my little session here. Hopefully you can um, get something out of it and look I love the format of this as well. It's pretty low key and relaxed and put your hand up, yell out. If you have any questions as I'm talking as well, um, by all means, throw them at me because that's what we're here for. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been in real estate for about nine years now, eight or nine years. I've, um, I've, worked, in, um, I've worked in the same area. So I started in, I chose an area basically where I grew up and where I live now. And I thought that was pretty easy to start with because I had a base of people that I knew and was familiar with. So I've done that and I've stuck at that. So I've been selling for nine years and in the same area now. And um, and I've changed agencies in the last couple of years. And off the back of that, um, in the last sort of 12 months, we, uh, Amy and myself, uh, Amy, my assistant here in the room as well, um, we've had our, our best year in, in, you know, a pretty average market, I suppose you can say. And, and off the back of that with um, what I'll go through today as well and have a chat about is just some real basic systems and processes that we have implemented in our business that I think anyone at any level in sales whether you're starting off or whether you've been in it for some time that you can hopefully take away and, and implement um, if you're not doing them already and, and notice a little bit of change because we've certainly, we've noticed that. So um, I'll get you to flip just to the first slide just quickly, Jess. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm fascinated about is, is obviously your better performers in the industry and, and, and how they use their time, how they're good. I mean, I'm really curious. I think a lot of salespeople are generally, but you know, why are they doing really good numbers? What is it, you know? We've all got the same amount of time and how do we use it? So I sat down, oh, I would have been Amy about 18 months ago when we, we made these changes and, and we actually, we sat down and we pretty much for two weeks put our calendar out and actually jotted down every sort of 15 minutes to half an hour exactly what we did. And I, you know, I've always been a typical salesperson where I've sort of flown by the seat of my pants, you know, you think you're busy, um, you know, you think you're pretty productive during the week, but what was actually quite clear that in two weeks of sitting down and doing that, there was a hell of a lot of wasted time. There was a lot of time that actually we weren't being productive and um, really, you know, using every minute of the day as best as we, as we can. Why I did that off the, back, well, off the back of doing that, basically my business was pretty much stagnant for five or six years. Like we had a pretty, I started fairly quickly. By no means was I a Shane Beaumont that sold 70 odd homes in my first year, but I had a pretty quick start. But for probably about five or six years, you get to the end of the year and the figures were really fairly similar. And you know, if I was gonna keep doing that, and, and I'm sure we can all, you know, this all resonates that, you know, I was obviously not doing the right thing or there was something that I wasn't doing that it was actually gonna allow me to grow. And um, it was quite funny, we, we showed, um, Amy and I showed this sheet to, um, to a bit of a mentor of ours that, that works in our business. And he said, you know, basically what you've shown me here, if you think you're gonna grow your business in the next 12 months, you're, you know, you're bloody kidding yourself. So what we did by doing that was, was, was work out right, stripping it right back, how can we actually grow our business, how can we use our time better and how are some of the tasks that we actually, you know, what, what, what can we implement in our business. So I would encourage, you know, if you haven't done that already or if you think you're not using your time right, that is a really um, an upfront tool that you can actually, you know, be honest with yourself and actually put it on paper and just see how, you know, how organised, how productive you actually are in your week. Because I can guarantee, and I was no, no different, um, there's so much dead time and there's so many things that you could be doing that actually can generate more business and build your capacity as well. What, what we also did, um, can you flick to the next one? Jess? So, as a salesperson as well, you know, obviously I, I've got to, if you want to grow your business, I, there's a certain capacity that you get to where you can only do so much on your own. So. Uh, Amy and I sat down and we basically had a checklist like this and we said, well, right, what are the things that I want to do and what are the things that I want Amy or the admin staff to do? And this is, a, again, you know, if you want to grow your business as a salesperson, you can't, you can't do everything on that list. And I know it's hard to let go sometimes and I was the biggest culprit of that as well, but we think that we should be in control of everything from, you know, being at a photo shoot to writing copy to 
you know, booking home opens with your vendors to doing all that minor detail where in fact a lot of it actually can be done by someone else. And um, again, it is a hard thing to let go, but once you do it, you'll be amazed at the, the time that it frees you up to be actually be sitting in front of more, uh, you know, potential vendors, dealing with buyers, just doing that dollar productive stuff. So I'm just giving you an example of the next slide, what I actually did, and you'll see that I actually didn't like doing a hell of a lot of the stuff there. <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. And um, the crosses are a little bit <laughs> off skew there. I don't know what's happened there, but, but really, if, if, you're, if you're fair dinkum about growing your business and writing more business, which I think you know, generally all of us are, no matter where, if you're writing $100,000 a year, if you're writing half a million or even more than that, really, at the end of the day, the ticks there are the things that really should be similar for all of us. Everything else, put a PA on, farm it off to your admin team, get someone else to do it because it doesn't really matter. It matters in the scheme of things, but if you're really keen about growing your business and building capacity, you need to be offsetting that. Does anyone have any questions about the, the, the daily tracker or, or this up here at all or any? Yeah, Di. <laughs> Beg your pardon? I'm happy to share. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really basic stuff, obviously, but you know, I, I, what I was guilty of is you think you're doing all these things right, but if you don't actually have any checklists and task lists in, in, in play and any processes, you just end up doing bloody everything. And you ride that roller coaster of you know, having a heap of listings and then selling them and then going, oh shit, where do I go now? We're back to scratch. So we've really found this useful by, this has really helped keep an even flow and, and consistency in the business of you know, giving me time to be actually sitting there and you know, prospecting, you know, doing all the things that we know how to do. And, and Amy also focusing on her, you know, her, her areas that she should be focusing on um, and allows me to be at the end of the day sitting in front of more people and doing more business, building more relationships and, and, and having that steady flow of business come into you um, in, in every month. So that, that, that off the back of, of sitting down and, and looking at, at time and then obviously working tasks and, and forming new job descriptions, it's just made life a hell of a lot easier. And, and, and again, I, I think it, if you start, I wish I had this when I started, put it this way, because I'd be a hell of a lot further than where I am now. Really simple tool, yep. So when you, when you did first start, you said you decided that you needed some people to help you. How yeah. many hours did you allow, bearing in mind, you got to cover the cost of that? Yeah. Yeah, look, it's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? I think we've all been through this, the fear of, um, that fear of knowing that to go to that next step, whatever it may be, um, that you do need help. And yes, there is a cost associated with it, but I don't think there's any right time. I think you've just got to do it and make it work and have no plan B and put it out there. But, but do you say that I need someone for 12 hours, 15 hours? So what I did personally, I, I put a, a full-time full assistant on straight away and um, yeah look look it is and I, I think it is but I also I, I, had, I think you've got to look at the bigger picture as well that if you really do want to grow your business to a level that obviously is desirable for you um, you've got to invest in that and, and I can honestly say that yeah it might take there might be that little bit of a that 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 initial process that with some teething problems and that to, to build momentum but again I think the key behind it is if you actually structure that person the right way to start with, um, you'll find that the, you'll, you'll just, your trajectory will be a lot quicker than it would be any other way. I personally, I think I did it wrong to start with and I'm the first to admit that. Um, Amy's been with me now for about two and a half years and when we started we probably weren't as structured as what we were now and we weren't getting that proactivity out of our week. Having made changes now, our, you know, we've increased our, our business in GCI 40% in 12 months. And there's no magic dust. I think a lot of it has been just by actually putting some better systems in place and, and having clear job descriptions between what I should be doing and obviously what she should be doing. What we've recently done as well, we, we've done this, um, I'd encourage you to do that, the, the, the daily tracker with your time as well, quite regularly. We've done it twice now in, tw in 12 months and we've even made some adjustments in it now and we've, and we've slightly changed Amy's role um, to becoming more um, prospecting and, um, and lead producing and we've actually been able to lean on the office more to do the, you know, yet really your, your, your very much non-dollar productive task that anyone else can do. Um, yep. Ben, yep. just you and Amy and your team, and who do you think actually manages the team that's 
Amy. <laughs> I'm no different. I'm a typical salesperson, you know. I'm not, I'm, I, 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 structure and, and, and process wasn't really, you know, I like to be out there doing deals. That's fun. I love that sort of stuff, you know. We're no different. But I'd say Amy's there running it and keeping me organised at the end of the day. We, we meet regularly and I think that's the key to obviously make sure that you're meeting every morning and you're checking in every afternoon and you're, you're, you're making sure that you stay on top of what should be done. But I think every good salesperson, female, male, uh, the, the, you need an even better person behind you that's giving you a bit of structure and that, that's Amy for me for sure. Yeah. Beg your pardon? No, so Amy's registered as well. So how we structure ourselves, and again, everyone does it differently, I know, so there's no set way, but the way that we've done it now is that Amy's more, um, she, she's got vendor management, so she looks after our vendors, so from listing to sale. Um, admin is doing completely, you know, you know, the, you know brochures and data entry, etc. cetera. Um, Amy's also prospecting, so working around, you know, magic 50s. Um, doing some door knocking and doing some um, uh, prospecting off the back of our stock as well uh, and also helping and assisting with home opens. So um, a bit of an all-rounder still but really getting rid of a lot of the stuff that you know someone in the office can, can do. And um, it all sounds so simple, which it is, but we were doing, we were trying to do a bit too much all ourselves and what was falling down was that clear flow of business coming in and out. Yeah. Um, next, oh, sorry mate, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Look, we they probably annoyed us a little bit. I've leant on them fairly heavily and said that I want a bit more out of them, so I'm a little bit demanding. But I think that's a good thing as well. Um, every office is set up differently, and I get that. But I, I think if you want to grow your team and if you want to grow your business, I really think you need to let. The hardest part is letting go of the stuff that really, if you're being honest with yourself someone in the admin department can do and it's not really going to affect your business to allow you to actually yeah, get out there more and, and, and get in front of potential clients and, and building your pipeline and putting more in there. Yeah. I'll just get you to flick to the next one, Jess. What, what, we also, what, what, what we've also found really useful as well is um, off the back of putting more structure in as well is with every listing having an audit, having a file audit of your listing. So. What I mean by that is, 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 you know, time and time again, uh, someone said it, and I thought it was really true as well. If if the commission check that, you, if all you're getting out of every listing is a commission check, then you're a bloody idiot, and it, and it's true. There's so much gold that you can get out of a listing, other than just the commission and moving on to the next sale. So what we created um, is is basically a fire audit checklist, and again, I'm happy to share this as well. You probably can't see it really clearly here, but. We really want to check at the end of each sale exactly what we're getting out of it and what data we're getting out of it. So, um, and, and again, there's a bit of process around that at the start as well. So obviously, as soon as we get the listing, we, we know what we need to do. You know, you know that you should be calling, you know, bringing up everyone in your database that lives on that street or in the surrounding streets and calling them and telling them that you listed the property. You know, sending out a buyer match email through your CRM. I know they all can do it um, to, to all your buyers on your database around that listing and what it might, you know, who it might suit. Um, through as well, if you, I'm sure there's all text capabilities through your CRM as well. Again, texting every home. So what we do is text everyone on, I think we've got about six or seven hundred people, homeowners in my, in my area, they'll get a text every listing that we obviously get as well. So you're covering those layers of obviously of touch points for your future business. Uh, calling the street, obviously when it goes under contract, when it goes under un, uh, unconditional, you know, home pass, etc. All these tools that you can use, we, we measure them now and obviously we make sure we tick that off and we date when we do it. The other things as well and the key ones down the bottom here that, that, are, really, that are really important is obviously throughout the week of your campaign as well is to measure, you know, obviously your home open numbers, how many email inquiries you've got, how many inspections, you know, how many leads and again I thought it was pretty cool with the property management synergy as well, how many leads are you passing on to your property management division as well, how many database entries. But the key one's really there as well, which we measure and we're finding really beneficial and that we set a target for, and you can see on the right there, is how many, new, how many homeowners do you meet with that listing that you can put to your pipeline? How many homeowners in the street, um, you know, in the suburb that you can actually get to put in your pipeline? 
So our, our goal for every listing that we've got in our core area is to have 10 new bits of data. And what I mean by data, 10 new homeowners that you can get their address, mobile phone number, email that you can put into your database. And at the end of the listing, we go through and check all this and, we, and we're accountable and we can see what we've done and what, we, you know, what we've got out of that listing. That, that in itself, that little, that little tool there that, that, that you can look back on every listing and actually see you know, how well you've worked it, how well you've worked that listing and what you've been able to get out of it is a, is a, is a huge, it's been a huge game changer for us. Whereas previous to that, we had no measurement. You know, you might know that, you know, I met a couple of owners in the street or, you know, Bob came through and I know he lives around the corner, but have you actually managed it and, ha and have you actually added it to your database and grown your database out of every listing? And, 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 and again, it doesn't lie as well, just like your time and just like your tracker. If you haven't done your job of your listing, if you haven't really milked it and worked it as hard as you can, um, those numbers won't lie at the end of it. And that's just made us become a hell of a lot more accountable um, around you know, each bit of business that, that we're not just getting the commission, selling the house quick and, and then moving on and hoping that another listing comes out of it. So that's been really beneficial. And out of, out of that, in, in 12 months, I think we've grown our database, Amy, by about 250 to 300 at least. Of, of, of homeowners that live in our suburb that will sell their home one day. Um, been a fantastic tool, I'm happy to share that. Any questions around that at all? Sorry, um, with the database, what do you do with it? Do you just send an email to text messages? What do you actually do with the database? Yeah, so what do we do with it? So what, what we do, we, with, with that, and that's just an example of obviously around listings, but communicating to our core area. So we send weekly emails um, of our listings and home opens. Um, we'll send um, a buy match email. So when we get a new listing just for that property, we'll send it out to the database of everyone that's got a search criteria for that type of property. And we'll also send a text. So the text message that I personally send and the way that we do it, we'll send it to every homeowner in our, every person that owns a, owns a property in Sorrento in our database, we'll get a text message saying that there's a new listing to the market. We'll, what we'll then do when it's sold as well, we'll send it to them that it's sold and with the sold price. So around every listing, we've generally got at least, I reckon, four to six touch points with that person for every listing. Now, if you're having, you know, depending again on areas, but if you're an established agent maybe and you're having 30 to 50 listings per year, you know, and four to six touch points with an owner in your suburb every listing, that's pretty, that's pretty good. That's pretty good communication. Pretty good communication. And I don't know, I think if you follow a system similar to this as well, I don't think there'd be many in any area that would that would do it, you know, like that. I think you just you can just get ahead of your competition with staying in touch and being relevant. And keeping in mind all this as well, you're not asking for anything. You're not asking to sell their home. You're not even asking for an appraisal. You're giving information, which is what it's all about. Yes, mate, at the back. Yeah, it's a funny one, and we, we, we speak about this a little bit. I think you're always going to get some unsubscribes at the end of the day. I think you're going to get that. When, when, uh, when I started doing this as well, I started it for a bit, got a few subscribes and sort of, you know, packed my pants a little bit and thought, oh, shit, I'm upsetting people. But you're always going to get that. So we just, we've just made it a non-negotiable now. You're not going to please absolutely everyone, but you'd be surprised at the feedback that you get. I, I think you've got to work, the, you know, it's a percentage game at the end of the day. You know, I think you're, going to get, you're probably going to get 20 to 30 people, percent of, of people that maybe don't want that, but I'd rather have the 60 or 70 percent of the area that are happy to get it. Yeah. With the sort price, do you text that after it goes unconditional or yeah. once it settles? Once it settles, just to be safe. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten in trouble for that before. I had someone that got a bit angry at me, but yeah, once it settles, I'll, I'll give that information there as well. And I generally do that as well, um, and I'll do that through off the back of Home Pass as well, I'm sure. Plenty of people use that, but send the text to the inspections coming through Home Pass and send them out the sold price as well. Um, and generally speaking, you might double up a little bit because there might be some homeowners in there as well. Um, but hey, at the end of the day, I'd rather have a, I'd rather have a conversation where someone's a bit shitty about getting too many texts and sort of soften that up than not communicating with them at all. Yes, Di. Um, we use my desktop personally at, at Ray White, so yeah, I think that's a pretty common one, and I think most of them will have the same capabilities, or they should. So that's 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 what we use, yeah. James. What categories have you got in your database for each of the contacts? 
for each of the contacts. Yeah, to have to put out the yeah. So, so, so pretty much what we keep it, we keep it really simple with ours. And I, I, I'm only focusing on one suburb, mind you. Um, if there's multiple suburbs, obviously, you know, it's a bit more broad. But the, the, the category that I'm focusing on is just homeowners in Sorrento. That's it. Um, we have other categories like buy, our buyer match email will cover the buyers, and that's very broad. But how I'm communicating with sellers is just with the sellers, people that own a property in Sorrento. That's who I. That's who I like. That's all I care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been good, Di. Keep me busy up here. A bit of water. Yep. So we use Active Pipe as well. Put your hand up if your agency uses Active Pipe around here. It's a good tool, and we use that as well. Um, and again, not to digressing a little bit, but to go into another conversation with Active Pipe as well. We, we'll use Active Pipe and look who is actually looking at the, each listing. And, and call them through as well, which is a great tool. Yeah, I, th I think the um, I think we're working off a rate of around thirty to thirty-five percent, which I think is fairly standard for response rate. Really across, I think that's a fairly measured. That's that's a pretty standard sort of rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, can I get the next one there, Jess? This isn't my pipeline as well. Um, that's just a. A picture that I stole off someone. So, um, but I, out of everything that, that's important with um, with with building, you know, building capacity, getting momentum. If you don't have a pipeline that you can that, that's in front of you that you can see that you can touch and feel, um, I don't think you're serious about it. Whether you've got a, a whiteboard like that style, or whether you have a CRM that obviously has a pipeline function on there as well, that that is that is one of the most important things that you can you can deal with and and you know it, it it really needs to be in front of you it needs to be you know you need to see it every day and, and that's that's your chase list so how how you know how I've worked with that and how Amy and I work with that as well um, off the back of all the communication I'm my job is wholly and solely focusing on that that pipeline of people that want to come to the market in three to six months time anything outside of that you know, they, they are on a call cycle and are, and are a reminder to speak to as well, and they're getting communicated with, but, you know, having that focus of people that are going to come, you know, the, the listings that have come to your business in 90 days is, is critical. Now, I never did that pr prior to that as well, and, I, and, I, and I, I think that's a failure as well if you don't, because you just don't have those people, you're not focused and you, you're not seeing who your potential clients are, and I think you're going to get leakage that way. By having it in front of you, you, you should just be zoned in and, and, and making sure that you're dealing with the people that you, you know are coming to the market. What, what, we've, what, I, what I'd also recommend is, I mean, as you get busier as well, I don't care if any, me personally, I don't want to be, I personally don't want to be locked in a room for seven or eight days, seven or eight hours a day making prospecting calls, even three or four hours a day. You, you, you can't do it. I, I don't care, I mean, if you've got a team of five or six maybe, but you, know, you need to be dealing with the now business and the people that are coming up but I think you also need to have a communication plan in place with the rest of your database that aren't probably, you know, that are a little bit further out. And that might, that might be someone else in your team, you know, calling, you know, going through and calling the people that aren't, you know, obviously ready to go to your business now, or maybe getting some telemarketing or a concierge to do that. Um, per personally, what I did off the back of all the changes that we made as well was um, put a, a, a 12 month communication plan whereby quarterly, um, We've got a concierge that actually calls our, our whole database. And when I mean whole database, not my whole, whole buyers, et cetera, but your core area where there's owners in your database, whether it be one suburb, two or three, they get a call quarterly from our concierge. So on top of uh, me, us, you know, you guys speaking with your pipeline and your people that are going to be coming up fairly immediately, you know, again, you, you, can't, you need a plan to be able to communicate with everyone. So whether it's yourself or a team member or we've got a concierge that does that, it's just in place, it's, it's there and they'll get a call every three months to see um, how they're going, offer them some information, offer them a market report and, and drive appraisals off the back of that as well. And, and again, um, it's, it, it really just rounds everything out and makes sure that, you know, obviously you're not going to get all the business in there but it really prevents those, those misses and those, um, th those losses that you might have or another agent just lobbed in front of them at the right time and you had forgot to call them in six months. 
So that's, that's, that's I think, a really important thing. Hey, Pete. Then 40% growth is really good besides the basics that you're implementing. Yeah. And the little changes, is there anything major that you've done that's attributed to the, such a, you know, nearly doubling your business, or was it a lot of little things built up? Yeah, it's, it's look, I, I'm not going to put it all down to this. I, you know, I'll be real about it. I think you know, as you go, you, you're building a little bit more momentum every year. I suppose what I'll refer to next is, um, is, is, is the stock management and process around how you sell your properties and what methods you choose. That's, along with this, that's actually been the, uh, the catalyst to actually um, you know, grow our business by that much. And what I mean by that as well is that we've, we've, we've shifted from being more private treaty to more auction focused and to, to a lesser extent, you know, tender, all offers presented, set date sale. And, and our clearance rate has, has improved and, our, and we've been able to build our capacity off the back of that as well. So, you know, I, the REWA stats that come out, you know, they're, you, know you, you, you can't hide them. You know, private trade is sitting at 80 odd days on the market, auctions 28 days or roundabouts. Um, I, that's been a really big shift and change in, in the way we go about things and, and how we look at our stock and how we manage it. Yeah. Have the sellers in your marketplace been quite receptive to the message? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I, don't, I think any, it, it's hard, James, all the time. I don't think it, you know, you don't just go and walk it. We haven't just been able to walk in and get an auction listing authority signed every time. It's a bit of a battle. And we've had, you know, we've had to, you know, we've had to build our training and our, our, our practice around that. But, um, Fortunate in the area that I work broadly in the coastal region that there's some really good agents in that and a lot of them are auction focused as well. I think if you look at that, they have actually been, you know, the better agents. They've had an auction business and it shows in their results. So, I mean, off the, so off the back of that, if you go to the last one, Jess, we've, we've, been, we've sat down and, and really made sure, and that's just an example there, but we've really been obviously, you know, we, with the market still tough, let's be honest, and it hasn't really improved at all, we've really focused on reducing our days on market by changing methods and actually sitting down, making sure that we sit down, you know, weekly and have a look at our stock and actually see where it's at. You know, it's a simple business, you know, I suppose out of all of this, and it's not to take the fun, we have a bit of fun and we, we have a good time doing it, but this is a really task orientated business that we're in. And if you do the task, you get the results. Looking at your stock and having that stock in and stock out attitude of, of where your stock's sitting is, is, is a fundamental and I, and I think if you're not looking at that and working out where your stock is and where it's at to clear your stock, um, um, think about that and maybe implement things and work out, you know, where's your, look at it weekly. Um, that's been a big change in how we go about it as well and actually analysing that. Anyone have any questions about that and how that works? Happy to explain it. Yep. Yeah, it's a pretty scary one, isn't it? And I think we've all been in that. And, and it, it, when it's all predominantly private treaty, it is hard to take that, that leap. Oh, to answer your question, I reckon for someone starting new in a new area to go and pitch auction, you'd have to be pretty good to actually, you know, do that off the back of not really having a track record. So that, that could be a thing, might be another conversation. I won't go too much and talk about auctions, but I think it's a great point of difference, but I think you'd need to help build your track record around that to really, it, it'd be pretty tough to do. But if you look at the stats, they, they don't lie. That, that there's, a, there's a fair argument to offer auctions to your vendors. Fact, if you go and offer your, if you look at your vendors and go, right, I can sell your home in roughly 28 days, or do you want the method where it's about 80 days? It's a pretty simple conversation to have. So again, it's not about completely going all auction. You know, we, we, don't, we still do a little bit of private treaty, don't get me wrong, but shifting to having a bit of process around your, your selling method um, is something to consider at least, I would say, to, to offer your vendors, yeah. Um, but the main thing, and whether you have a spreadsheet or whether you have a whiteboard where, you know, you've got all your stock and you check it weekly, you know, how many days on the market that it's been, you know, where's your seller at, you know, what price do you think it could sell at today, and maybe where you have to feed back some interest levels to get them to meet the market, that's a really good conversation to have every week with your team or, your, you know, yourself and look at, so that you know that you, you're getting your vendor closer to a result um, every week, um, much better. 
and out of all of this, I, you know, I think it's just about looking at your business and taking it a little bit more seriously and going, right, how can, I, how, how can we have a really fine-tuned business whereby you know, we, we give great service, we, we, we get great results, but we're building our business as well and we're creating extra capacity by reducing our days on market. So if you can save, you know, what's that, 28 and 80, do the maths, Ben, 50 odd days on market, if you're gaining 50 odd days on market, if you can reduce your days on market, that means you should be bringing more listings in your business and selling more properties. Sounds simple, I know, it's not easy, but um, the change of method and by looking at your stock and, and making sure that week by week you can get it closer to getting a result, I think that's a really professional way to look at your business versus just you know, rocking up every week to a home open, getting a few people through and saying, yep, yeah, we'll see you next week. Um, your vendors will appreciate it. Maybe some hard conversations come out of that as well, but in, in order to grow your business, I think it's, a, it's, it's important. We found it important anyway ourselves, yeah. Yes, Steph? Just instead of just doing that inside your team, looking at days on market, what's come on the market, what's sold, if you meet with your vendors every week and have those conversations with them, you're building your trust with them, plus they're actually starting to see what's really happening around them, as opposed to, well, we'll just wait and see what happens next Saturday. We'll just wait and see. Absolutely. We're just waiting for the buyer who really sees it. If you start meeting with your vendors every single Tuesday, that Tuesday's the day that we do, um, and going through, we've been on the market now for 21 days, we've had 37 inspections, we've had 150 inquiries, and this is where the feedback is, then it starts to paint a very clear picture for them about what is happening and how the market's responding, and you're not telling them what you think. Spot you're on. Saying you're sharing with them, and really, we call it vendor management, but it's really vendor education, because they're not looking at the properties that are on the market one of the most powerful things is I usually do these meetings in the office and we have a screen up and we go through, these are the properties that are on the market that are competing with yours. And there would be a property that's $200,000 less than theirs and they look at it and they go, oh God, wow, you get a lot for your money these days, can't you? Um, and yes, and somebody else is gonna buy that property instead of yours if we stay priced at that level. And I think that that can be a game changer because it does reduce your days on market, which means you're not carrying that guilt and the whole weight of having 15 or 20 sellers who aren't moving mm. for 80 days. Yeah, you're right. That, like, that's a really good internal tool to have in your team. But off the back of that, you know, it's, it's right. Well, what, off the back of, you know, that, exactly that, what conversation do I need to have with my vendor this week, do you know, to get to a help? I mean, you're helping them at the end of the day. You're doing them a disservice if you don't have those conversations. So yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's all part of the service, but that, that's a great internal tool for you to go, right, well, what am I doing wrong? Or how, how am I blocking my vendor from getting a result at the end of the day? Am I, am I stuck on price? Am I getting in the way of what I think it's worth? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you think it's worth, you're not buying it, but you need to give them evidence as to why um, it's the right offer or, or it's the right change to make. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. That's, that's all part of, I think the key one out of that that I take out of that, Steph, is it's not you sitting down and telling them they've got an ugly home and it's worth too much. It's giving them, in a different conversation, a different spin, the reasons why maybe, you know, they need to, to, to think about having a change. And then over a period of time, they don't want to come in anymore. 
So you find that, are you really committed to going? And that's how I'd often start the conversation. The conversation would be, just so that we're on the same page, obviously, you're still looking for self, and they sort of laugh. And I say, oh, it's really important that we just know that that's still where we're headed. Because things can change for them, or they might, as the feedback comes in lower, they might go, it's not, it's not worth us going at that level, and then you can have the conversation around, well, where do you want to go? You told me this. Um, if we sell it this level, you might still be able to do that. Right. Yeah, and it's really important to do it face to face. It takes more, a lot more courage, um, but often people are grateful for the information. Typically, they would make the commitment in their own mind by the time they have these conversations with them, because they clearly know where they feel it and they need to go. Yeah, and the worst is when you take on a, a, a spare listing and they say, like, we were overpriced, but I don't even know why they even put it on at that price, because we were never expecting to sell at that price. But if you haven't had that conversation, the agent was probably too afraid to tell them that it was worth $100,000 less. But if you're not having those conversations, then you're missing the ball. And I think that's a great point as well and it's it's about managing your time and you owning your time and actually taking control of the sale as well and and that it, that's a little it's a little win that you've got over your vendor as well I'm not saying it's a competition but it's a little win that you've got and you're getting them in your in your area as well yeah it's hard because they're going to push back do we really need to meet of course and particularly at the beginning of the campaign in those first four weeks um, you really need any other questions at all, guys, on anything that I can potentially shed some light on? How often do you meet with your sellers? Weekly. Weekly? Yeah. Um, sometimes not as structured as that, um, but weekly face-to-face. -face. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, constant, you know, you're constantly speaking to them on the phone, but I, again, I completely agree with that. The shift that you get by being face-to-face and having a conversation, and and what that unearths some what it unearths sometimes as well, um, even surprises all of us. I I, I think we've, we can all say you know when you've sat in front of an owner and the conversations flowed sometimes, what you actually might get out of it, um, find some little bits of motivation as to you know find out information that you did you, you wouldn't normally get, um, you know I think you see time and time again, and when you when you pick up the odd listing as well that another agent's got, you might get it second time around and you pick up the little things that they weren't happy with. And a lot of the time it was, it was the fact that they actually hadn't taken the time, you know, to sit down with them, have a chat, even, you know, as basic as call them back after a home open, which I mean, Christ, that's our job. Um, but it's amazing and, and it's just that breakdown. And, and I think all they want at the end of the day is for you to be speaking to them about how they can actually sell their home and move on to the next step. It's, it, it's funny, isn't it? Some of the, the, the most simple things aren't being done and that, that gets in the way of actually helping someone to move forward. Hey, Shane. Yeah. How do you get around with the training and stuff? Do you do with Mark? Yeah, I, I deal with Mark McLeod. Um, he's great because he doesn't preach about the Eastern States market. He actually takes the piss out of them a little bit. He just said, mate, they're order takers. They're, it'll be funny watching him when it starts to go south a little bit. So, uh, again, I, yeah, it, it's funny and you hear stories about, yeah, you know, all you have to do is get the listing authority and 100 rock up to auction and they have 14 bidders and it sells 200 grand over reserve and the agent's, you know, clapping himself. And I've never experienced that. Can't wait. But, um, <laughs> Be lucky if you get a couple to your auction, but um, yeah, he, he's good like that, Shane. And, and we haven't really he caters, you know, the training's catered for our WA market. He's actually great because he enjoys it because it's a bit tougher and you can sharpen your tools a bit better. But I think um, personally, it's frustrating listening to the coaches that are probably Eastern States based because they're commentating on markets. That, you know, we're talking cheese over here. Yeah, it's not real. Um, Mm. Yeah. 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 Look, I'm, again, I suppose not, not about plugging your agency here today, and I understand that. But yeah, if you just look at the auction method, yeah, I, we get it, it. It should be compatible in any suburb, in any marketplace, if you run it correctly. And I, I've been guilty of, of cocking up a heap of auctions myself. And I think the only re reason why an auction stuffs up a lot of the time is because the agent stuffs it up, not not the buyers or the process. It's the agent. So. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty good in that regard, but yeah, completely chalk and cheese to running an auction on the east coast of Australia to Perth. It's, um, 
bloody frustrating at times. But uh, the bigger picture of that, and I, again, I won't go on about it too much more, but if you can help get your, you know, it, forget about clearance, you know, clearance on the day, you know, selling prize and option, obviously. Rarely these days, or, you know, I think it's 30 or 40% on the day, the clearance rate is for auctions in WA. Um, but more often than not, there's a sticker on the signboard in the, in, the, in, the, in the following couple of weeks. And I think the bigger picture is if you, can, if you can get a result for your owner in nearly half the amount of time that it would with private treaty in some regard, it's, it's still a success in my opinion, yeah. Are you still encouraging offers early in the peak? Well, I know a few years ago, some of the big offers were like, yeah. you know, don't give them everything up front, you want to get to auction, but you know, Mark, are you encouraging offers to go through price of the day? Absolutely, yeah. And I, what we're finding as well is the success. If you, look at, if you look at auctions that don't have an offer prior to the ones that actually have offers, offers prior to auction day, it's the, the success rate's huge with the ones that actually have offers. So we try and have a bit of a benchmark as to how many offers that we can get prior to auction. Um, not trying to sell it, but they actually form more of an education tool for the owner to actually realise where it's at. The ones that I find f fail is the wrong word, but that don't sell on the day is when there's been nothing brought forward. Yes, you've got vendor reports and feedback, but there's been no real hard evidence as to the feedback on where the property should be. If you're getting offers prior, you'd be surprised at where the owner's actually, you know, set the reserve or look at having a result on the day. It's, um, it's, it's quite interesting, but yeah, certainly we encourage offers prior. And if it's the right offer as well, you can't stop your owner from taking it at the end of the day. Yeah, you can't play God. Mm. I think we're yeah yeah I, I I think we're pretty hard on auctions like I, 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 all, you know everyone in agents the consumers out there as well that they judge it by the success of the auction day on the fourth weekend but you don't hear people bagging the shit out of a private treaty on the fourth weekend if it doesn't sell do you you know like. <laughs> They just pretty much go, right, we'll see. Agent just goes, oh, right, we had two through. Yeah, that was all right. I'll see you next week, mate. We'll have a home open. But on the day, on the fourth week, if it doesn't sell shit, it's the end of the world. It's like, yeah, that, that, I think that's really hard to explain to vendors and buyers sometimes. And that's the fear. It's a bit of a fear of an agent that if it doesn't sell on the day, that it's a complete failure. But if you look at the overall picture, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. In fact, you're helping your, your, your seller get a bit closer to a result in half the amount of time. But um, yeah, that, yeah. It's a battle, isn't it? Especially when we're private treaty focused. Yep. So can I have a little argument with you about auctions? <laughs> How about it? You're, I don't want to argue with you, Nikki. I think I'd, I'd come off second best. How about a conversation? Uh, I'm not a fan of auctions. Sure. And let's face it, the only reason they have them in the eastern states, I believe, is because there's a cooling off period. And that doesn't apply to auctions. Sure. So. Auction and you have bids, you're lucky enough to have bids, 
and you're bidding like this, 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 and then this person is successful, they might be prepared to pay that for it, but they, could, they only needed to pay this. So they only, you only get just over your second best price. So those are my opinions about mesh. <laughs> <laughs> Not a <bad>. <laughs> <laughs> The great thing about this is we all got opinions and, and they're not all right or wrong, are they? <laughs> I just wanted to share mine with you. It's a sharing day, you know. And you know what? I, what you're saying, I mean, I, I, but my, my question around that would be, my market that I work in as well is probably not, a, is not as hot or as heaters as like a, a Subiaco, Claremont, you know. Let, let's say, for example, my only argument with that would be that if you've got a property that you know that you can sell on the first day to two or three people, yeah. if you looked at it, Let's look at it a little bit left of centre. Yeah. How many more buyers could you get over a four week period and get on one day and competing with each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you've got three or four competing, you usually get a really good price set. Spot on. There's no reason you can't bring the auction day forward if you've got competition on the second weekend. You can bring the auction day forward and run the auction. Well, the other thing I don't like is the ticket to auction is not sold far. It's like, hang on, guys. You know, it's one thing or the other. You know, so I'm getting yeah. this big auction. I'm going I'm to buy this property and I'm all excited about it. And then, oh, we'll sell private auction. You know, it's, to me, it's I think I'm... I haven't seen 10 people in a, a day of 10 on open for three years. <laughs> so, <laughs> my whole thing is to go on You're <laughs> you know, jealous hearing that. It's bloody <laughs> painful, isn't it? But Num number one, I think you've got to believe in the process at the end of the day. If you don't believe in the auction process, don't even bloody do one. So I think, yeah, look, and, 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 you know. But the, the only thing that I will, I will argue as a point to that, Nikki, we're no different to the eastern states. They have a lot more people wanting to buy property at the moment. A lot of those people don't have cash sitting in the bank. They bo they're borrowing money. They've managed to be a bit more organised prior to the auction, spoken to their broker, got themselves in a position where they can bid. It shouldn't be any different to over here. I would say one thing being, don't judge me, but from Adelaide and um, obviously selling everything via auction, when you buy a property at auction in Adelaide, the bank will value the property at the price that you paid for it at auction. No questions asked. So you can confidently bid knowing that you'll get the valuation. When I came to Perth, I was shocked to find that Mm. And that would be very scary as a buyer because you could go in thinking that you've got pre-approval but then the bank values it less than what you paid for an auction. And I wonder if that's perhaps why consumers are a bit... Could, could be an element of that. Look, I think a lot of it's just around education that actually... Five minutes? Cool. Um, that there's education around for buyers and consumers that just don't know how to bloody buy an auction. They just haven't been, and an agent maybe hasn't actually taught, you know, spoken to them about, okay, this is what you actually need to do. Let's be honest, it's more bloody work as an agent to sell an auction versus a private treaty. We'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> but all, all I will say, I suppose, finishing on that, again, I think we, you could talk about this all day and it's great, it's interesting because everyone's got great ideas and opinions, but all I would say that, especially in a heated market, Nikki, that as an agent, it's easy to sell a property in the first week. But if you carried that to four weeks, and let's say got a result, how many more homeowners in your area would you meet over that four week period? How many more buyers would you meet? And the ultimate, and the ultimate thing, if you can get multiple buyers competing for that property on the day unconditionally, I don't think there's any better environment to get a premium unconditionally for your seller. 
Yeah. yeah. Attached to the agent. I do. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I I don't I just kind of convince myself it's like it's like I always have this um, irrepressible urge at the end of an auction when someone's successful <laughs> yeah. to go up and shake their hand and say, Congratulations, you were the only sucker prepared to pay this much for this But <laughs> 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 you work for your salary. You yeah, yeah, I know. It's kind of it's it's kind of I think yeah, I d I don't know. We'll chat about it over a coffee, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, mate. Do you become any options or on site? Uh I do on on site, we, we, we do a lot of, but our office probably, you know, there's not many that do them, but we, we have a monthly in-room auction on a Thursday night at the Breakwater Tavern upstairs. Um, again, I don't think there's any right or wrong, but yeah, bit of a point of difference where you can get by. That's probably more of an efficiency thing for the business as well. We're taking an hour or two out of your day on a Saturday or Sunday, depending on where you do it. In-room, Thursday night, hour or two, they're done. Um, you know, again, they're huge over Eastern in New Zealand. Um, not so much here, but not a bad point of difference, I think, to offer your vendors um, and good efficiency for your business, not taking too much time out of your home opens on the weekend, yeah. Cool. That's probably enough from me. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Cheers. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We'd love any feedback or guest suggestions. So hit me up on Instagram. You can find me on Jess at Crib. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe and be sure to tell a friend.